Okay, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, would you would you mind closing the? Uh, excellent. Thank you. So first, just an administrative announcement. So the final exam has been scheduled. Um, it will be Monday, uh, April nineteenth. Uh, at um, 9 a.m., we decided. Yes, 9 a.m. Uh, so Monday, uh, bright and early, uh, final exam. Um, you know, the uh, conditions under which you take this exam will be the same as the conditions under which you took the midterm. Uh, no outside resources allowed. Um, no notes. No uh, psychic connections with people who know the answer. Uh, anything like that. Um, and the... Uh, Length of the exam will be three hours, as usual. Uh, the difficulty of the exam will probably be marginally more difficult than the final, but not too much more difficult. Um, you know, my in the past, my finals have been uh, quite challenging. Um, I expect this one will continue to be reasonably challenging, but not impossible. Uh, so that's the goal. Don't worry about it too much. Just try and, you know... Relax. The important thing is that you relax and enjoy yourselves and try and learn a little mechanics and do some interesting physics. And don't worry too much about exams and grades and all of that crap. Um, okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and um, start doing some physics. Are there any questions about the final? Um, you know, uh, the final is centrally scheduled. I don't decide the time and place of the final. So in principle, it is scheduled so that none of you have conflicts. Um, I don't know what happens if you guys have a conflict. I guess you schedule a makeup. I don't know. It's all handled by some other office. The brilliant people at the Central for Exam Scheduling take care of all of that, so I don't know exactly how it works. Um, but, yeah, if you have a conflict uh, regarding the time of the final, I guess you can talk to them uh, about rescheduling the time at which you take the final. Um, any other questions about the final? The midterms haven't been graded yet. So at some point, uh, Thursday, if they've been graded, or next week, if they haven't, we'll, we'll have a little discussion about that. Um, OK, but uh, enough uh, stupid administrative stuff. Um, let's go ahead and do some physics. So uh, last uh, class, or rather the last class we actually did mechanics, which seems like it was a very long time ago, uh, given the break and the midterm and all of these things. Uh, the last time we actually did physics, uh, we studied uh, physics in rotating coordinate systems. Uh, and the, go the goal of this was to understand how uh, non-inertial coordinate systems lead to uh, so-called fictitious forces. Um, and the primary example of a, a non-inertial coordinate system was that of a rotating reference frame. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to apply uh, many of the formulas uh, that we discovered in our study of rotating coordinate system uh, to study the generic motion uh, of uh, an arbitrary body of arbitrary shape. And so in particular, what we will spend this class and part of next class discussing uh, is the motion of rigid bodies. And by a rigid body, I just mean some object whose uh, shape and uh, distribution of matter is fixed and is not allowed to flex uh, or bend in any way. Um, so, um, this, so the motion of rigid bodies is uh, a subject which, for some reason, has the reputation of being a little dry and boring. Um, you probably uh, remember a little bit about inertia tensors and uh, stuff and Euler angles and stuff like that from your elementary mechanics classes. Um, and uh, what I would like to try and do uh, in this presentation is emphasize a bit more uh, the conceptual aspects of the motion of rigid bodies. Um, and I think the motion of rigid bodies is really uh, important because uh, so far in our studies of mechanics, we have studied very, very simple mechanical systems, systems with essentially uh, effectively one degree of freedom. You know, we started by studying oscillators and one-dimensional systems, and then we proceeded to study uh, the two-body problem, which through a careful application of Noether's theorem could be reduced to a system with one degree of freedom. However, when you study... Uh, more complicated mechanical systems, um, you can't always reduce the system to that of one degree of freedom. 
Uh, life just isn't always that simple. And the theory of rigid bodies, the theory of the motion of rigid bodies, is really uh, the first example uh, that we will encounter in this class of a system uh, which cannot be redu reduced Uh, to a single degree of freedom. And so we will really need to consider multiple degrees of freedom corresponding to the angular momenta or angular velocities of some rotating body, which all interact with one another in some way which can't be really reduced to that of a one-dimensional system. And so this is really where mechanics starts to get interesting. And uh, in some sense, some of the problems that we will start studying today and next class are really... Uh, some of the most famous and most elegant problems in the theory of classical mechanics. You know, the, the theory of the motion of rigid bodies is considered sort of the pinnacle of the theory of classical mechanics because it is complicated enough that you have all sorts of rich features associated with uh, multiple degrees of freedom, yet it's simple enough that you can really uh, get a handle on it and understand intuitively what's happening in a lot of cases. And so um, this is really, uh, in some, to some extent, the sort of pinnacle of, uh, of the classical theory, you know, the 18th and 19th century theories of, uh, of, of dynamical systems. Um, now, after our discussion of rigid bodies this week, uh, we will then proceed next week to study uh, more general features of uh, systems with many degrees of freedom and treat them along a general lines in the same way that we treated uh, the one-dimensional system rather generally uh, about three weeks ago. So are there any uh, questions of, of a general nature on things that I have just said before I dive into the details? Okay, so let's imagine that we have some sort of rigid body some object uh, with a specified distribution of masses or mass densities, uh, which is not allowed to flex um, and which is freely moving in space. Well, uh, if we wish to describe the dynamics of that object, then the way that we start, of course, is by computing the Lagrangian. And the statement that the object is free to move is the statement that there is no external force, and in particular that the Lagrangian is just equal to the kinetic energy of the system. And so our goal uh, is to compute then the kinetic energy of a rigid body which is freely moving. Okay. So let's first consider uh, the so let's first consider the following uh, very simple case. So let's first consider a mass, which is just uh, some sort of point-like object, so some sort of point mass, which is undergoing some rotation. So, for example, this could be uh, the point mass, uh, which is this coffee cup, uh, which is undergoing rotation because the Earth is re revolving around its axis at the rate of 24 hours per day, or once per day. So, then, if we let r, the vector r, denote the position of the particle, then we could write the position of this particle either in uh, space coordinates in a non-rotating coordinate system where I would write it as ri prime ei prime summed over i or uh, more useful for today's purposes I could write it in coordinates which are rotating along with the rotating coordinate system. So in which case I would write these position of the object in rotating coordinates as ri ei summed over i, where I remind you these eis are the rotating coordinate axes. And if I wish to compute 
the kinetic energy of the object, then I must first compute the uh, velocity of the object in this coordinate system. And if we take our, uh, our coordinate system, to be rotating uh, along with the point mass which is rotating, then uh, that means we're choosing our coordinate system such that the position of the object in this rotating coordinate system is equal to a constant. So that if we want to compute the velocity of this point mass, our vector dot, then if we just plug it in, taking the time derivative of this uh, second expression in terms of the rotating coordinate axes, the velocity vector is the sum on i, ri, times the derivative of the rotating coordinate axes with respect to time. Which, if you remember from last class, was just omega cross ei, where omega was the angular velocity vector. So in a sense, this is the definition of angular velocity, the angular velocity vector. EI dot is equal to omega cross EI. Do you guys all remember that? It was a few, it was about two weeks since we had this lecture, but you just did a problem set on it, which was due yesterday. So hopefully that allowed you to remember a few of these things. You know, I'm very clever. There's a reason why I had the problem set due yesterday. Do you guys all remember this, presumably? Yeah, okay. No, yes, no, any sign of life out there? Raise your hand if you do not remember this. Okay. You don't remember this? Or you just... Well, I do remember Okay. Yes. EI dot... Ooh, there's a dot there. Uh, EI dot is omega cross E. That's practically the definition of angular velocity. Okay. Uh, or if I wanted to uh, write that a little more compact, compactly, R dot is omega cross R. Just using the fact that R is equal to the sum on i, r, i, e, i. Okay? So that means that if we wish to compute the kinetic energy of this particle, which is one half m b squared, then that's just one half m times the square of the vector omega cross r. The, the length of the vector omega cross r. Or if I wanted to write this out uh, a little more explicitly, I could use uh, the following identity from uh, vector calculus. So presume, perhaps you remember that a cross b dot a cross b is equal to a squared b squared minus a dot b squared. Do you guys remember that identity? Um, I'll give you a hint. Uh, if you don't remember this identity, uh, well, we could do two things. We could derive this identity, or I could tell you why it's true. Um, why don't we? Why don't I first tell you why it's why this identity has to be true? So a cross b dot a cross b is something which is quadratic in a, and it's quadratic in b, and it vanishes if a is proportional to b. And if you look at this expression, a squared b squared minus a dot b squared, you'll see that that's the only expression I can write, which is quadratic in a and b, which vanishes when a dot a is proportional to b. Right? If a points in the same direction as b, then a dot b is the length of a times the length of b, and this expression vanishes. So that's like the so that's the, the easy way of remembering this formula. Uh, once you remember the fa once you remember the fact that a cross b squared vanishes when a is parallel to b, then uh, automatically you know that the only thing that can it can ever be equal to is some constant times a squared b squared minus a dot b squared, and then that constant can be figured out just by thinking about it. You just think about uh, well, uh, you know that when a is perpendicular to b, 
uh, this should just be the length of a times the length of b squared. So that, that tells you that it has to be a squared b squared minus a dot b squared. Was that too fast? Would you like me to derive this formula for you? I mean, you probably derived the, the hell out of this formula in your uh, vector calculus classes and your uh, electromagnetism classes. Uh, would, you like, would anyone like me to derive this formula? Uh, if you do not remember this formula, um, well, you should. Uh, so I recommend that you either memorize this formula or uh, use the trick uh, that I taught you to remember how to derive this formula whenever you need to. You know, it's always better, it's always, uh, better to not have, have to memorize any formulas. It's always better to be able to figure them out whenever you can. So that little trick I told you about the fact that this is the only thing quadratic in A and B, which vanishes when A is parallel to B, will always allow you to remember this equation. I didn't remember this equation. I haven't memorized this equation. I just figured it out when I wrote it down, and you can too. Uh, okay, so enough uh, 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 enough blather. Uh, if we use uh, this expression, then I can write the kinetic energy as one half m omega squared r squared minus omega dot r squared. Um, so that's the kinetic energy for a single particle. So let's now imagine that we have a rigid body which is made up of a collection of point masses which are all rotating together. So they're all collectively rotating. So for example, you could imagine that you have some collection of masses, perhaps connected by uh, rigid rods, which are then all uh, connected together in some uh, static rigid configuration that is then undergoing some rotation about, say, about some axis. And we would now like to use uh, this fact that the kinetic energy is given by this simple expression to write for a single point mass to write down the kinetic energy for this full collection of point masses. Well, uh, now all we need to do is just sum over all of the masses that make up the system. So if we let our alpha denote the position of some part of the system, let's call it the alpha part of the system, where alpha runs from one up to the number of point masses which make up this rigid object, then the kinetic energy is given by taking the kinetic energy at the top of the page here and just summing it over all of those different point masses. So it's the sum over alpha, one half m alpha, where m alpha is the mass of the alpha object, times omega squared r alpha squared minus omega dot r alpha squared. Uh, is that expression clear? Um, all I did is take the formula for the kinetic energy of a single particle undergoing some rotation, and I summed over all the particles that we have in the game. And all I am assuming here is that the, this rigid, all of the different constituent particles of this rigid object are undergoing the exact same rotation, specified by the same angular velocity vector omega. That's what I mean by a rigid body. They all undergo the same rotation. So, this formula is all uh, well and good, but the point about this formula that I would like to emphasize is that it is something which is quadratic in the angular velocities. So just as the kinetic energy of a particle undergoing linear motion is quadratic in the linear velocities of the particles, the kinetic energy of a rigid body is quadratic in the angular uh, velocities of the body. And because of that, 
it's convenient to write this kinetic energy in a different form using what is known as the inertia tensor of the object. So what we notice by looking at this formula is that this can be written as one half omega i, here, let me write my sums here, one half omega i, i i j, omega j, summed over i and j. So here, omega i Uh, denotes the set of three components of the angular velocity vector in these rotating coordinates. And uh, when I sum over i and j, I am summing i and j from one up to three. And here, i, i, j is a set of nine quantities labeled by the subscripts i and j, which both run from one up to three, which is given by the sum over alpha m alpha r alpha squared delta ij minus r alpha i r alpha j. So, boy, that's an annoying sound. Is that coming from the machine shop downstairs, probably? Okay, that, pro that hopefully means it'll be gone in about a second. Um, so, uh, who's the smartest person in the class here? Did we, we decided this, didn't we? Someone point to their friend and accuse them of being the smartest person in the class. You're the smartest person? Okay. Since you're the smartest person in the class, if that sound does not disappear in five minutes, run downstairs and tell them that uh, they should be quiet until after 2.30. Okay? Um, yeah. And because you're the smartest person in the class, it won't matter that you've missed five minutes. Okay. Okay, you can go. Great. Um, although it, maybe it's just stopped. Great. Okay, well, so let's look at this formula for the inertia tensor. So this set of nine quantities, I, I, J, is known as the inertia tensor, inertia tensor of the object. And you can see that if you sum over I and J, omega I, 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 J, omega J, what do you get? Well, there's the first term, which is an m alpha r alpha squared times omega i delta i j omega j. Delta i j here uh, is the Kronecker delta symbol, which is equal to 1 if i is equal to j and 0 otherwise. So omega i delta i j omega j summed over i and j is just the same thing as omega squared. Is that clear? Because omega i delta i j omega j summed over i and j is just a sum over all omega i's and omega j's where i is equal to j, which is otherwise known as omega 1 squared plus omega 2 squared plus omega 3 squared, which is the length of the vector omega squared. So I assume you guys have seen the Kronecker delta symbol before, either in this class or in Jim's E&M class. Um, and uh, it's just a useful way of writing out uh, this expression that I've written here. And then let's, let's look at this expression here. Well, you have the sum over i omega i r alpha i, which is omega dot r alpha. And uh, the second term with j gives you another omega dot r alpha. So you can see that this second term here gives you that term here, whereas the first term gave us this first term here. So this inertia tensor is just uh, a convenient way of writing out the kinetic energy of some rotating body. So you guys, I'm sure, have seen inertia tensors before. Is that correct? It, you didn't, did you see the inertia tensor in your freshman mechanics class? Very briefly. Very briefly. Well, you're seeing it again now, and I'm sure you understand it much better now than you did then. So the basic point is that the kinetic energy, one-half omega i, 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 j, omega j, is quadratic 
in the angular velocities. Just like uh, the kinetic energy of some point particle is quadratic in the linear velocity. Now, for point particles, the uh, coefficient of the uh, kinetic energy uh, is the mass times the velocity squared. So here, uh, the coefficient of the angular velocities is given by this 3 by 3 matrix called the inertia tensor. So you should think about the inertia tensor as playing the same role for rotating bodies that the mass of a particle did for bodies undergoing linear motion. It's just the co set of coefficients that appear when you write the stress tensor as some, when, when you write the uh, kinetic energy as something that is uh, quadratic in the angular velocities. I didn't mean to call it the stress tensor there. That was a, uh, that, that was a snafu on my part. Um, okay. And the inertia tensor, Iij, which again was the sum on alpha, m alpha, r alpha squared, delta ij, minus r i alpha, r j alpha, is just some set of nine quantities, which can be defined for any rigid body. And the point is that it is just a property of the rigid body that is independent of whatever motion the rigid body happens to be undergoing. So it is just some property of the object in the same way that the mass of the object is some property of the object. However, uh, this inertia tensor um, has several uh, very interesting properties. So the first property, so first of all, are there any questions on this before I continue? I should maybe say a word about the, the language that I'm using here. Um, a tensor here means, for all practical purposes, a matrix. So the word tensor is probably a word that you have not encountered before. Um, have you encountered the word tensor before in your electromagnetism class, presumably? Yeah, okay. Um, so for all practical purposes, tensor means matrix. And so you, we could call this the inertia matrix. But uh, for reasons that I won't go into, uh, both historical and uh, mathematical, uh, we like to refer to it as a tensor rather than a matrix. But that word should not scare you. It just means that it's a three by three matrix. But it is a three by three matrix uh, with uh, two uh, rather special properties. So the first thing that you should notice is that it is a symmetric matrix. In particular, I, I, J is equal to I, J, I. So why is that? Well, the Kronecker delta symbol, delta ij, is symmetric because it doesn't care about the order of the i and the j indices. It's just either one or zero if they're equal or not. And if you look at the second term here, if I switched i and j, I would get the same thing back again. So the inertia tensor is a symmetric three by three matrix, not just any three by three matrix. And moreover, uh, because it is just a property of the object, it is time independent. If the object is rigid, and so the parts of the object are not undergoing any motion relative to one another, then this inertia tensor is just a constant. Now, of course, you could try and consider more complicated objects, which are flexible and undergoing motion in, in some more complicated manner. And in that case, you would have to describe the Lagrangian of the object uh, in terms of more quantities than just some constant inertia tensor. But for the purpose of rigid bodies, the inertia tensor is all that you need to know. So, so far, I have written down the inertia tensor for a collection of point masses. 
Um, it is also po possible to write down the inertia tensor for a uh, continuous body. So let's imagine that rather than having a finite collection of point-like masses, we have some mass which is distributed according to a uh, density rho of r, then if we want to write down the inertia tensor for this continuous body, then all we need to do is take this formula here for the inertia tensor for a collection of point masses and imagine approximating this continuous body by a very large number of point masses of very small mass distributed according to this mass density rho. <coughs> So from a practical point of view, what does that mean? What that means is that I write down the same formula, except where I was previously summing over a discrete number of particles, I now integrate over all of the, all of the uh, position, all of the points of the body. So I integrate over the body. And instead of summing the mass, I integrate the mass density times this quantity uh, in parentheses, which was r squared delta ij uh, minus um, r i r j, or if we wanted to write it using the notation of vector calculus, r dot ei times r dot ej. Remember, of course, that ri is just the same as r dot ei, and rj is the same as r dot ej. Uh, so the only difference between these two formulas here is that I've replaced the sum by an integral, and I have left off the index alpha, because rather than summing over discrete r alphas, I'm integrating over all r. So um, is this formula clear? Is, go, is the way that one goes between the formula for the inertia tensor for a discrete collection of masses to that for a continuous body clear? Okay. And of course, this inertia tensor is also a symmetric three by three matrix, which is time independent. provided the body is a rigid object. So in order to understand the motion of rigid bodies, we will now have to understand a bit more of the properties of these inertia tensors. And in, in particular, we will have to understand what these inertia tensors look like for a variety of objects of interest. Um, so the first thing uh, that I would like to point out is that since the inertia matrix I is a symmetric real matrix, uh, it can be diagonalized. So you perhaps remember from your linear algebra classes that it is not possible to diagonalize every real matrix. Uh, you can only put it in upper triangular form. But if the matrix is symmetric, then an upper triangular matrix is diagonal. So hence, uh, a real symmetric matrix can be diagonalized, uh, which means in particular that there exists some Orthogonal matrix O, now remember an orthogonal matrix is just the three by three matrix which represents a rotation, such that the matrix O, I, O transpose is diagonal. Is there a question? So in particular, O, I, O transpose is equal to a diagonal three by three matrix. Uh, 
whose entries I could call I1, I2, and I3. So, the uh, orthogonal matrix O uh, represents the rotation, which is necessary uh, to put I uh, in a diagonal form. So remember that the inertia matrix, the inertia tensor I, was defined by starting with a particular uh, coordinate system that was rotating along with the body. Now, uh, and that was a coordinate system with coordinate axes EI. And so I could define a new set of coordinate axes. I guess I could call them EI prime which are related to those original coordinate axes by the action of this rotation matrix. And these are the axes with respect to which I, I, J is diagonal. Or uh, to say that a little more prosaically, if I had started out with these coordinate axes, the EI primes, which are related to my original co rotating coordinate axes, EI, by this rotation matrix, OIJ, then if I went ahead and computed the inertia tensor in these coordinates, I would find that the inertia tensor is a diagonal matrix. So these three axes, EI, are three special directions which are associated with the rigid body. And these three directions, which are associated with the, with the rigid body, have a special name. Uh, they are known as the principal axes. of the body. Um, so perhaps there's a little bit of a confusion here because previously I had used EI prime to denote the spatial coordinates. Um, I paused a little bit when I wrote down this equation because I knew it would be a little confusing to call this EI prime as well. So let's call them something else. Uh, what would we like to call them? EI double prime? No, too many primes. What's that? EI tilde. No, but there's a vector symbol. Uh, we could put a hat. Okay, let's put a hat. Okay, everyone looks better with a hat, right? It makes you look cool. So um, these EI hats are rotating along with the body, but, they're, 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 but they differ from the original coordinates by some rotation. But the important point is that this OIJ is constant, right? Uh, the general orthogonal transformation which relates the Cartesian coordinate axes to the rotating coordinate axes is a time-dependent rotation. But when I go between the EJ and the EI hats, that's just a constant rotation. Um, and that reflects the fact that the stress tensor is constant. So the matrix that diagonalizes it at one point in time will diagonalize it at every point in time. Is, is that, hopefully that's clear. So what that means is that associated to every rigid body, we can find three coordinate axes uh, with respect to which the inertia tensor is diagonal. So these uh, axes are called the principal axes of the body. And there's no uh, real... Math, I mean, there's no, uh, there's, there, there's no sort of systematic way of finding the principal axes of the body uh, other than simply taking your inertia matrix in some coordinate system, computing it, and then diagonalizing it. And then, as you probably remember from your linear algebra classes, 
The vectors which diagonalize it are just the row vectors or the column vectors of those orthogonal matrix of that orthogonal matrix which diagonalizes the inertia tensor. Do you remember that from your vector calculus class? You, you, I'm sure you were taught it in your in your linear algebra class. If you want to find the uh, axes uh, with respect to which the inertia tensor is diagonal, uh, you start with the inertia tensor in some general non-diagonal uh, coordinate system. You find the orthogonal matrix which diagonalizes it, and then the rows or columns of that diagonal matrix are the axes, are these principal axes. Although, uh, in practice, that is an exercise that you very rarely have to undertake because uh, these principal axes are usually obvious because of the symmetries of an object. So, uh, you know, if you have some totally random looking blob which has no obvious symmetries, then uh, there's no trick for finding the uh, principal axes. You just have to compute them by diagonalizing this matrix. But if you have an object which has some symmetry, then usually you can just look at the symmetry of the object and guess what the principal axes are. And I'll go through several examples of this in a few minutes. Um, so there's another uh, bit of language that is associated with the inertia tensor, which is that the IIs, uh, which were the uh, diagonal elements of IIJ, uh, computed in the principal coordinate system or computed with respect to the principal coordinate system are known as the principal moments of inertia. And more frequently, uh, we will tend to drop the word principal and just refer to them as the moments of inertia of the object. So these three quantities, which are the diagonal elements of the inertia tensor, once we have diagonalized the inertial tensor, um, are also uh, also have a name uh, which you hopefully remember from linear algebra. Um, they are the eigenvalues of the inertia tensor Iij. That's the definition of an eigenvalue. It's the thing uh, which, if, you ha if your matrix is diagonal, they're the diagonal entries. And likewise, these principal axes are the eigenvectors of the matrix. You guys hopefully remember eigenvalues and eigenvectors from linear algebra. If, okay. if you don't, I recommend uh, going and reminding yourselves. So what can we say about these principal moments of inertia? So the first thing that we can say about the principal moments of inertia is that they are real well, that's not too hard to show. Iij is real, so if it's diagonal, its diagonal elements are real. But moreover, they're positive. And that's something that's actually not entirely obvious. It's certainly not true that for an arbitrary real symmetric matrix that the, um, that the uh, eigenvalues will be uh, positive. But it is true for the inertia for uh, a three by three matrix, which is the inertia tensor of some rigid body. So why is that true? Well, let's imagine taking a unit vector, 
with components ci. So c squared, which is the sum on i, ci squared is equal to 1. That's what it means for it to be a unit vector. Then if we compute i, i, j, c, i, c, j, summed over i and j, what is that? That is the sum over alpha, m alpha, r alpha squared, minus r alpha dot c squared, which is the sum on alpha, m alpha times a quantity which is always greater than or equal to zero. So why is it always greater than or equal to zero? Uh, well, um, well, first, is it obvious? Okay, why is it always greater than or equal to zero? Well, c is some unit vector that points in some direction. And so r alpha dot c squared uh, means that you compute uh, the component of r alpha in the c direction and square it. And then we subtract that from the total length of the vector r alpha. And so that quantity will always be positive because the total length of the vector r alpha is always larger than the square of any component of the vector r alpha. And of course, in this expression here, there is a c squared, which I said equals to 1, because c was a unit vector. So because um, the sum on ij, iij, cij is the sum of the mass times something that's always positive, that means this total thing is always greater than or equal to zero. So that for any unit vector, I could compute the sum over i and j, i, i, j, c, i, c, j, and that quantity would be positive. And if you think about it, that means that all of the principal moments of inertia need to be positive. Because what is a principal moment of inertia? Well, a principal moment of inertia, I, I, will be E, I, okay, this is going to be a little, I have a lot of indices here. So let's say, Okay. There we go. Uh, so the principal moment of inertia in the EI direction. So let's let EI hat be. Okay, how can I say this? The principal moment of inertia in the C direction is the sum on I, J, I, I, J, C, I, C, J. Um, or more specifically, if I take one of these, uh, if I set C, I equal to one of the E, I hats, the components of one of the EI hats in the original coordinate system, then this quantity that I've computed is just II. Sorry, that's not, is that clear? It's not clear. Okay, let me say that a little more clearly. Let's imagine we have one of these uh, principal axes. Then I could write this in terms of the original coordinate system as OIJ ej, and so that means that the uh, components of the original of this principal axis are given by the set of six of three quantities oij for some fixed value of i, and then the statement that oij is an orthogonal matrix is the statement that if I think of O I J as a, if I fix I and I let J run from one to three, then that is a unit vector. 
And so I could then plug this into the previous formula and I would where C is set equal to OIJ. So in this case it would be CJ would be OIJ where I fix I and then you would see that what I've computed is just the principal moment of inertia, the ith principal moment of inertia. Sorry, there are a lot of indices flying around here. The reason why I did this original computation is that it only had a few indices. Okay, another even easier way of seeing it is that these E i hats are eigenvectors of the matrix i. And so if you want to compute the eigenvalue of a matrix with respect to some eigenvector, all you need to do is unit normalize that eigenvector and compute E transpose times I times E. And that gives you the eigenvector for the eigenvalue for the matrix. Is that one clear? Okay, I've now explained it like four different ways. None of which, all of which have a few too many indices uh, and uh, to, to be completely comprehensible, but presumably the superposition of all of those explanations made sense. Okay. Um, so, uh, if this is not entire, if this derivation is not entirely clear to you, I encourage you to go through it again on your own time. This is, you know, dealing with manipulating indices like this is is something that one really has to get used to and. It can't really be taught. It can only be uh, understood through uh, through practice. So I recommend, uh, if this statement is unclear to you, that you go through it uh, on your own time and try and, and prove it to yourselves. So I should mention one additional consequence of this little calculation. So you can see that this quantity up here that was greater than or equal to zero is equal to zero only if r alpha points in the c direction. So what that means is that one of the principal moments of inertia will vanish only if all of the masses which make up the object lie in the C direction. Which means that this happens only if the object lies along a line or uh, more uh, said in a more fancy way, this will happen only if the object is collinear. So we've just proven a little theorem, which is that the principal moment of inertia of an object can only vanish if the object lies along a line. And uh, I will invite you to prove to yourselves the second following uh, theorem which is that two of the moments of inertia of an object vanish only if the object is a point mass. So I invite you to try and prove that to yourselves. So um, all of these discussions of moments of inertia have been uh, a little uh, formal. So perhaps it would be useful if we went through a few examples and computed the moment of inertia uh, for some objects. So are there any questions before I continue? No questions? Okay. It's all crystal clear? Excellent. Okay. So let's consider uh, the following example. So let's consider a point mass which is a distance r from the origin. And I would like to compute the inertia tensor about the origin. Um, I should emphasize, of course, that the value for the inertia tensor and the principal moments of inertia will depend on what I choose as my origin. The, and that's easy enough to understand uh, intuitively because the inertia tensor tells us how the kinetic energy depends on the angular velocity. And in order to compute the kinetic energy and understand how it depends on the angular velocity, I need to know about which point the object is rotating. So let's imagine that we have a point mass located at some position r, 
and I wish to compute the kinetic energy uh, for that object rotating around uh, the origin. So let's take the origin to be right there at the center of this coordinate system, and let's take the object to be displaced by the origin from the origin by some amount r in the z hat direction. So this vertical axis will be z, and these others will be x and y. So what is the inertia tensor? Well, there's no sum to do because I just have a single point mass here. But it is m times r squared delta ij minus ri rj, where r is the vector describing the location of the particle, which in these coordinates just points in the z hat direction. So now, just looking at this problem, you can immediately guess what the principal axes are. The z-axis has been singled out because I've chosen coordinates where the object is displaced from the origin by the z-direction. So it's a pretty good guess that one of the principal axes will be in the z-direction. And indeed, if you go ahead and compute uh, the full inertia tensor in these Cartesian coordinates, you'll see that the uh, x, y, and z axes are all principal axes. And the moments of inertia are just computed by evaluating the diagonal values of this tensor um, in the Cartesian coordinate system. So, for example, Rz will be m times r squared minus the z component of r squared, but r points in the z direction, so that's just r squared. Hence, the moment of inertia in the z direction vanishes. As indeed we saw it could for a collinear object. And a point particle is an example of a collinear object. What about ix and I, iy? Well, ix will be m times r squared, because of the delta ij, and then rx is equal to zero because the object is at x at equals zero. So ix is just mr squared, and for similar reasons, so is iy. Is that computation clear? So let's move on to a uh, more exciting object. So let's imagine that we have some sort of thin rod uh, with mass density, which is evenly distributed along the rod. So the mass density will be given by the mass of the rod divided by its length. And let's compute the inertia tensor about the center of the rod. So again, let's take a coordinate system where the rod points in the z direction. So here the rod will imagine it's very thin so that it's confined just to the uh, line x and y equals z, but extends in the z hat direction. So again, the principal moments of inertia will be, the principal uh, axes will be in the x, y, and z direction. Uh, iz is found by integrating over the body. So there's no x and y integrals to do because the mass density is a delta function in the xy plane. But we still have a z integral where you integrate from minus l over 2 to l over 2 of r squared minus r dot z hat squared, which of course is equal to 0 for the same reason that it was above. If the object 
is only at the point x hat equals y hat equals z hat, then r squared is equal to z squared, or otherwise known as r dot z, z hat squared. Is that clear? So now if we wanted to compute ix, then I would have to take the density, which is just a constant, so I'll pull it out of the integral, and integrate from minus L over 2 to L over 2 dz of r squared, which is just z squared, since x and y is equal to 0, uh, minus x squared, which is equal to 0, which is m L squared over 12. There's a one-third coming from integrating z squared, and then a one-fourth because I square, I cube, uh, yeah, uh, then a one-fourth because I'm squaring L over 2. Wait, is that right? I'm cubing L over 2. Did I get this wrong? Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm adding it together. It's L over 8 plus L over 8. Yes, which is, uh, let's see, yeah, okay. Got it? Wait. Yeah, there's a one-third. Yeah, it's one-third times one-eighth plus one-eighth. Yeah, okay. Good. Excellent. One-twenty-fourth plus one-twenty-fourth being one-twelfth. And, of course, that would be equal to IY uh, by symmetry. Okay, uh, so let's do one final example. Let's imagine that we have a disk uh, with density rho, which is, again, uh, evenly distributed. So it would be the total mass of the disk over pi r squared. And let's compute the moments of inertia about the origin. And here, let's take the disk to be in the xy plane. So now we know that all three of the moments of inertia will be non-zero because the object does not lie along a line. It lies along a plane. So what's ix? Well, that's the density m over pi r squared times the integral over the body. Uh, which is probably easiest to do in polar coordinates because the object has a rotational symmetry. So I'll write that as an integral from 0 up to r dr and an integral of 0 to 2 pi of r d theta of the quantity which is uh, r squared uh, otherwise known as x squared plus y squared minus x squared. So this here is y squared, which is r sine squared, r squared sine squared theta. And so in order to compute this, let's see, I have an r integral which will be the integral of r cubed, which will be 1 fourth r to the fourth times the theta integral, which is the integral from 0 to 2 pi of sine squared, which is equal to pi. Uh, so the trick for doing the integral of sine squared or cosine squared is to remember that sine squared and cosine squared always average to 1 half. So if you integrate them over some number of periods, it's just 2 pi times a half, which is pi, uh, which is 1 fourth uh, m r squared. And of course, uh, that will be the same as i y by symmetry. And finally, i z will be given by the exact same thing Except in parentheses, I have x squared plus y squared minus z squared, but z is equal to zero because the disk is located on the xy plane and z equals zero. Uh, 
So I just get twice uh, what I computed above. So one half mr squared. Is that clear? You'll get some chance to practice this in your problem set. Presumably you did some computations of this sort in your earlier mechanics class. Okay. Uh, oh, the computation of IZ. Yeah, let me, I can write it down in a little more detail. So it's the density M over pi R squared times the integral over the object which I again do in polar coordinates. So zero to r dr, zero to two pi times r d, r d theta. And then I have r squared minus r dot z hat squared, which is uh, x squared plus y squared uh, minus z squared. Or just x squared plus y squared because z is equal to zero on the disk because the disk is on the xy plane and z is equal to zero. And so when I do this integral, um, that's just twice the integral that I did above. And so I get one half mr squared. Yes? Before you said that um, for Yes. Where would you place the point mass in order to get two zero? Because if you place it at the origin, then you just get all three. Yes. In fact, all three will be equal to zero. Oh, okay. So yes. it wasn't a case where two are. I wasn't. Yeah. No. 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 I didn't mean to say that two would be equal to zero and the third non-zero. Sorry. I, I hope I didn't imply that. I, what I meant to say is that if two are zero, then the point mass has to be at the origin. In which case, as you say, the third will be zero as well. So I, yeah, I, sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, yeah, I didn't mean to make a confusing statement there. Thank you for for clearing that up. So I should make uh, a little bit of a point here. Um, for a generic object, uh, the principal axes are going to be unique. However, there are certain cases where the principal axes are not unique. And in fact, you can show that the principal axes are not unique only if two or more of the moments of inertia are equal. So for example, in all three of the objects that I have considered here, the ix is equal to iy. And that is a reflection of the fact that all of these objects have a symmetry of rotation around the z-axis. And so because of that, uh, there's no special way of declaring that one particular direction is the x-axis. You could always do a rotation to move it somewhere else. And in fact, I invite you to, to, to check for yourselves that um, whenever you have principal moments of inertia which are equal, one can always do a rotation between those principal moments of inertia to uh, redefine the principal axes. But for a more complicated object whose principal uh, axes all whose principal moments of inertia are all different, the principal axes will be unique. Um, and of course, as I emphasized, uh, the moments of inertia and the inertia tensor depends on the origin about which I am rotating. So the origin I used to compute the inertia tensor. And uh, in general, uh, it's very hard to say uh, if I know the inertia tensor about one point, how I could compute it about a different point. So for example, if I handed you an inertia tensor and I said, this is the inertia tensor of some object, then you would not necessarily be able to compute the inertia tensor about some other point given only information about the inertia tensor at a given point. However, there's one exception to this, which is a very uh, useful thing to know, which is that if we know the inertia tensor about the center of mass, then it's easy 
to compute the inertia tensor with respect to another point. So how would I do this? So let's imagine that we have uh, some collection of points, R alpha, and some masses uh, at those points, M alpha. Then the center of mass position is the sum over alpha of M alpha R alpha divided by the total mass, the sum over alpha M alpha. And so let's imagine that we know the inertia tensor about the point, uh, about the center of mass. And we wish to compute the inertia tensor about some other point. Uh, so let's say that we want to compute the moment of inertia, the inertia tensor about some point which is shifted away from the center of mass by some vector c. So how would we go about computing this? Well, uh, in order to make our life easier, let's just use a coordinate system such that the center of mass of the object is at the origin. which means that the sum over alpha, m alpha, r alpha is equal to zero. I could always just put my uh, or the origin of my coordinate system there. And then what we want to do is compute the moment of inertia about the point C. So I'll call that I, I, J, superscript C. So what is that? That's the sum on alpha, m alpha, of the r alpha squared in the coordinate system shifted by an amount c. So that's r alpha minus c squared times delta ij minus r alpha minus c i times r alpha minus c j. Here, those i and j indices denote the i and j, uh, the ith and jth components of those vectors. So let's look at this term by term. So let's first look at this, the part of this expression uh, which is independent of c. So just expanding out those quadratic terms then the part which is independent of C is just the stress tensor evaluated about the center of mass. Right, C equals zero is when uh, we're computing it about the center of mass. Now let's look at the terms which are linear in C. So let's imagine computing this term the part of this term which is linear in C. So we would have the sum over alpha, m alpha, of minus 2c dot r alpha times delta ij, coming from the first term, just expanding out uh, the square. And then from the second term, I would have two terms. There would be minus ci r alpha minus cj minus cj r alpha minus ci. Sorry, that expression there is a little hard to read. So that's r alpha minus cj. Now here's the important point. We're using coordinate systems where the center of mass is at the origin. So the sum on alpha of m alpha r alpha is equal to zero. So that means that all of these terms vanish, right? So let's look at that first term. I could just move the sum on alpha inside and write that as minus 2c 
sum on alpha, m alpha r alpha times delta ij. Yes. I'm sorry, thank you. They're going to be zero in a second, which is why I wasn't terribly careful about the sign. But yes, thank you. Right? And so this is equal to zero. And likewise, the second component here, for example, would involve... Oh, I'm sorry. Why did I... I was just looking at the linear terms here. Sorry. I said I was doing the linear terms, which means I have a C I R J and a C J R alpha I. And so for the exact same reasons, these other linear terms vanish as well. They're just the sum on alpha, M alpha, R alpha, J. So those were all the terms that were linear in C. And all we're left with are the terms which are quadratic in C. So we have the sum on alpha, M alpha times C squared delta IJ minus uh, CI CJ. And note that that quantity in brackets, in parentheses there, is independent of alpha. So I can just rewrite this as the center of mass moment of inertia plus the total mass, sum on alpha m alpha, of c squared delta ij minus ci cj. Is that clear? I was, you know, I went a little fast here because um, I moved all the sum on alpha. The trick here is to move all the sum on alphas inside my parentheses, inside my dot products, inside everywhere. And then use the fact that that vanishes because I'm in a coordinate system where the center of mass is at the origin. So this means, yes, was there a question? No. Um, any questions? So this means that if I know the moment of inertia about the center of mass, I can compute it about any other point. Uh, so for example, earlier I computed the moment of inertia of a disk about its center of mass. Let's compute the moment of inertia of a disk with constant density, but instead about the point which is displaced in the exact direction by a little bit. Well, so what is the inertia matrix in this case? Well, let me just write it in matrix form uh, just for uh, a change of pace. So it's one quarter r squared in the x direction as well as the y direction and a one half r squared in the z direction plus m times this quantity in parentheses here which is c squared times the identity matrix minus c i c j and since C points only in the X direction, that is C squared, zero, zero. So that this is M times one quarter R squared in the X direction, but the Y and Z principal moments of inertia have been shifted by C squared. And in particular, you can see that they always increase. Okay. Now, I should point out one thing here, which is that we displaced 
the object in the x direction, and the x principal moment of inertia was unchanged. And you can actually prove that this is true in general. So that if you displace an object, in the C hat direction, then the following quantity, which is C hat transpose I times C hat is unchanged. And that's equal to one of the principal moments of inertia if C hat is one of the principal moments of inertia. So if you displace an object along the direction of one of its principal axes, then the principal moment of inertia in that direction will not change. Uh, I invite you to prove that to yourselves using the formula that I wrote down on the previous slide. Okay, so we now have all of the information at our fingertips to study the rotation of an arbitrary body. Uh, I'm out of time today, so this is what I will tackle next time. Uh, but before I stop, uh, let me ask if there are any questions. Okay, see you on Thursday. Uh, there's a problem set up here for you.